Welcome to the RSET training, Large Scale Applications of Machine Learning Using Remote Sensing for Building Agriculture Solutions. We're delighted that so many of you are joining us today, and wherever you are joining from, welcome. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first part of this three-part webinar series. For those that are new to RSET trainings, the following slides provide a brief overview of the program. RSET is an acronym which stands for the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RSET is part of NASA's Earth Action Capacity Building Program. RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, tools, and applications. The goal of our trainings is to increase the use of Earth science, remote sensing, and model data in decision making through training for professionals in the public and private sector, environmental managers, and policymakers. On the right of the slide, you can see the different thematic areas in which we conduct trainings, and I hope you will join the listserv to learn more about upcoming trainings as they are offered. Trainings are offered online and in person and are targeted to beginners and advanced practitioners alike. Trainings are freely available and conducted either live, instructor-led, or self-guided, such as our Fundamental to, to Remote Sensing training. Since 2009, the program has reached over 100,000 participants from over 170 countries. All our trainings are cost-free with materials offered in bilingual and multilingual languages and are freely available to use and adapt for your curriculum. If you use the methods and data presented in our set trainings, please acknowledge the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. And if you want to learn more, please visit our website. The following slides provide an overview of the three-part webinar series on large-scale applications of machine learning using remote sensing for building agriculture solutions. So why would somebody want to take this training? Well, timely and accurate in-season crop maps at local to regional scales is crucial for agricultural decision-making and management. Irregularly spaced time series are common with optical satellite images. Training robust models on remote sensing data often requires very large data, but processing and training is complex. The cropland data, layer, cropland data layer provided by the United States Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistics Service only gives estimates of the types of crops released to the public a few months after the end of the growing season and not their sequence or timing. By the end of this training, participants will be able to Use recommended techniques to download and process remote sensing data from Sentinel-2 and the cropland data layer at large scale with cloud tools. Produce interactive plots of maps, tables, time series for investigation and verification of data and models. Filter data from both the measured and target domains to serve modeling objectives based on quality factors, land classification, area of interest overlap, and geographical location. Build training pipelines in TensorFlow to train machine learning algorithms on large-scale remote sensing and geospatial data sets for agricultural monitoring, and utilize random sampling techniques to build robustness into a predictive algorithm while avoiding information leakage across training, validation, and testing splits. The prerequisites for the three-part training are the fundamentals of remote sensing, crop classification with time series part two, and you must sign up for the uh, sign up for and access the Databricks Community Edition. Links to these trainings and how to sign up for the Databricks Community Edition are provided. Over these three weeks, from March 5th to March 19th, there will be three one and a half hour sessions, which will include presentations, demonstrations, and question and answer sessions. All materials, code, and recordings from each session will be available from the training webpage. If you are not able to attend one part, a recording will be made available within 48 hours of the training day on the RSET website. Homework opens on March 19th and will be due on April 1st. If you, uh, you will be able to access the homework from the training webpage on March 19th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. 
The remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website prior to next week's training. It is now my pleasure to introduce the guest trainers for today's webinar, Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen. Dr. Just is a principal data scientist at John Deere and an, an affiliate assistant professor at Iowa State University in the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department. Mr. Sorensen is a senior data scientist at John Deere, where he utilizes large-scale remote sensing data and machine learning to unlock insights and efficiencies for agricultural producers. John and Eric, Eric over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Eric Sorensen. I'm a data scientist, senior data scientist at, at John Deere. Uh, I'm happy to kind of present this uh, series to you all. Yeah, and thank you, Sean, also. Uh, this is John, and we're happy to be part of this uh, program. And I'm a principal data scientist at John Deere and also an affiliate faculty assistant professor at Iowa State University uh, in the Agricultural and Engineering Department. Great. Yep. Thanks, John. So with that, yeah, I'll take it take it away. Um, so part one will be dealing with uh, data preparation of imagery and labels for large-scale machine learning modeling. Some of the part one objectives. By the end of part one, participants will be able to programmatically submit lists of boundaries to the NAS API and retrieve the cropland data layer rasters back, subsample and visualize retrieved data from the cropland data layer with interactive spatial images and other statistical plots, obtain Sentinel-2 raster files for a given area and time frame corresponding to the retrieved CDL data, and manipulate the Sentinel-2 rasters into tables in preparation for analysis and model training as well as verify correct processing of the data via various interactive plots. Uh, for example, we'll be doing some uh, time series of pixels and various land covers. So in section one, we'll deal with irregularly spaced time series modeling and methods and processes uh, to deal with that. So what is irregularly spaced time series modeling? When dealing with satellite imagery, um, it's very common uh, that we'll have Regularly spaced time series uh, data, which means that we're not going to have, you know, one image every five days guaranteed, for example. Um, this is common due to multiple reasons, such as orbital geometry, variations in exact orbit timing and geolocation and image extents, as well as atmospheric disturbances due to things like clouds and smoke or other random events that obscure the view of the Earth, which is what we care about. So, for example, um, this plot showcases uh, kind of an NDVI, which is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Um, for two fields from Sentinel-2, uh, NDVI really just showcases the levels of uh, vegetation amounts. And so we can see kind of over the growing season for these two fields, um, the vegetation is low when during the bare, uh, showing bare soil before the crop uh, grows. Uh, as the crop grows, NDVI spikes, and then as the crop gets harvested and dries out, NDVI goes back down. What we can see in this plot is that there's a lot of noise scattered on throughout these images. Um, and these, no these are often due to things like cloud cover um, that add noise and data that we don't want during our modeling process. Additionally, um, these two fields are spaced approximately two kilometers apart. However, A has about two times the scene coverage, and this is just caused by uh, an orbit data overlap. And so there's multiple processes and, and methods that we need to consider um, to make this irregular space time series a little bit more regular to prepare it for modeling. So what's the motivation for this example that we'll go over in this training series? So we propose a real-time prediction of the cropland data layer labels as the working example for this tutorial. The CDL algorithm is already using the same or similar satellite data sources and irregularly spacing timing to make predictions. And so this is kind of a documented example of success of using irregularly spaced time series modeling for prediction of crop type classifications. These labels are readily available via API calls. And so we can easily uh, grab them at scale and they're, they're freely available. The accuracy of this is also well studied and documented. And so, Again, we can kind of use this process to 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 work with the satellite image and the CDL data, and the resulting code from this training is highly transferable to other problems and use cases as well. 
uh, by simply just kind of changing out the maybe the CDL algorithm for for a different task. And so this should be useful um, for these training purposes. So a little bit of background um, on predicting the cropland data layer in real time. So according to their FAQs, the, the CDL program uses medium spatial resolution, about 30 meter satellite imagery, because it's too costly to use higher resolution satellites to perform crop acreage estimation over large areas. Um, any higher resolution, um, the data scale grows really, really quickly. And so it's it's much fe more feasible to kind of train uh, to create cropland data layer predictions at every 30 meters. The cropland data layer is also considered confidential and market sensitive during the growing season and cannot be released until after the official NAS year end area county estimates are published in late January, early February, following the end of the typical US growing season. And so the CDO only gives estimates of the types of crops, but not their sequence of timing either. So, for example, if we have double crops or, or two crops grown within the same growing season, um, the CDO will say that the that there was a double cropping that occurs, but it won't give the order of, of which crop was uh, grown first and, and second. So our question really is, is, you know, do we really need to wait until the following year for accurate estimates uh, for crop type? And looking at kind of this example here, where we're comparing corn and soy time series of, of NDVI images again. Uh, it, it becomes really apparent quickly that from this time series imagery, we can be pretty confident in the crop type just from looking at the NDVI in this area. Um, so for example, in early May and in June, we can quickly see that the NDVI curves diverge between corn and soy. And so we can be pretty confident in our model predictions between corn and soy predictions in this case. And then especially in late August, um, as the NDVI growing curves um, grow down, as the vegetation decreases, as the crops dry out and get harvested, we can be very, very confident in about August um, in the crop type prediction, which is six months prior to when the CDL is typically released. So we can really get ahead of the uh, curve here and, and make these CDL predictions ahead of time um, before the official um, model is, it, results are released for the year. The approach that we teach in this, in this series is also very generalizable. Um, so Robust models require large-scale data management tools and approaches. Leveraging multi-core, multi-machine parallel computing is a very necessary step to, to scale up and working with satellite imagery. So we demonstrate these tools and approaches with this series, and so you should be able to use this same code um, and methods to solve any other problem as well with other data uh, sets as well, including other satellite images. We'll use Sentinel-2 for this uh, training series. Note that a similar approach to crop modeling with the time series imagery could be used for estimating other things as well, other than the crop land data layer labels, such as things like crop health or other time dependent factors as well. I mentioned double cropping before. Uh, you could use this method to, for example, predict if a field was double cropped and which crops were, were planted and harvested in what order. Uh, so exa for example, we can see in this time series imagery, again, this is a clear example of, of double cropping. In the, in the first part of the year, uh, winter wheat was harvested. It was planted likely in the fall and then harvested around uh, May timeframe. And then right after winter wheat harvest, soybeans were planted. And we can see the, the growing curve for the soybeans um, in this NDVI plot. And then additionally, the, the soybeans were, were harvested in the fall. Um, and so we can use this exact same method by just to predict a double cropping by just simply changing maybe the the, the label uh, that we're predicting on. Furthermore, um, there's not many examples of statistical theory around unevenly spaced time series. And so there's not much for out-of-the-box methods to apply directly for these situations. The most common solution uh, to applying machine learning models on irregularly spaced time series is to manipulate the data into a more regularly spaced time series and then apply more standard machine learning methods. So for example, interpolation or interval binning is often applied. The CDL algorithm actually applies the interval binning method um, and then trains a decision tree on it. Note that the resulting data format from this part one demo will support any modeling approach. Um, so we will follow a very similar approach as the CDL does with bend intervals for parts two and three of this demo for data loaders and model training due to its simplicity. 
Um, so then you can train any traditional machine learning model um, on this more regularly spaced time series of imagery. There are some newer machine learning sequence models, such as transformers um, and self-attention uh, that accept positional encodings of inputs and outputs and learn meaningful absolute and relative input and output information, which could facilitate direct modeling of unevenly spaced satellite data. But due to the increased complexity of those uh, examples, we don't incorporate it in this training series. We'll, we'll stick with um, regularly binning the, the irregularly spaced time series and then training a more traditional machine learning model on that data. So that will get into section one of this training series, going into detail on the Crapland data layer. So the Crapland data layer is um, a model that is released by the USDA um, that predicts the crop types for the contiguous United States and where crops are, what crops are planted in what locations. The best place to find information about this is the USDA NAS FAQs and the metadata on their site. So some relevant info and highlights, the model that they use is a decision tree classifier. It handles missing, non-continuous, non-normal, non-linear data, um, and it's very efficient in, in its computation. It also provides probabilistic outputs. We can actually provide um, confidence bands on how confident the model is in its prediction. And we can convert that to a class uh, to whichever class the model is more confident in will be its ultimate prediction for that location. The input to their models, they use three different satellite sources, uh, NASA, Landsat 8, and 9, as well as the Indi Indian Space Research Organization, uh, resource set two at uh, list three, as well as the European Space Agency Sentinel two and two B. The imagery is downloaded daily with the objective of obtaining at least one cloud for usable image every two weeks throughout the growing season. This strategy is pretty common when working with satellite imagery, a strategy of combining multiple different satellite sources as input, um, as it minimizes the chance of, of getting bad pixels or bad images due to things like cloud cover. The ground truth used for the model was the FSA common land unit for crops uh, and the national land cover database for non-agricultural areas, so like cities or urban areas. The accuracy of the model is generally 85 to 95% correct for the major crop specific land cover categories and its resolution is 30 meters. Speaking more on the crapland data layer accuracy, as noted earlier, the Kreplin data layer accuracy is well studied and documented. Below is an excerpt from the USDA quality checks for Arkansas in 2022. Additional studies of accuracy can be found at the USDA NAS Kreplin metadata site. Some crops, for example, like sorghum, may have very low accuracy, but they also represent a tiny proportion of the farmland. So this is something important to note as we're using this to train another model. Um, crops that the more major crop types have more representation and thus the cropland data layer is more accurate to predict them. So things like corn, cotton, rice, and soybeans have much higher representation in the data. And so the cropland data layer uh, is more accurate to predict on those crop types than say sorghum, which have a very um, low representation of total farmland. And so it has a much lower accuracy. We can see here that for Arkansas in 2022, the accuracy for predicting correctly the sorghum crop type is 22% where the other major crop types varies about 85 to 295%. And so that's important to keep in mind as, you know, if you were interested in predicting sorghum, for example, using the cropland data layer as input, um, you might get lower quality results than if you were trying to predict corn or cotton. So now for some context on some data, how, how big the data can get for these types of problems, uh, specifically for the crapline data layer, if you're going to try to train the crapline data layer on the contiguous United States. So even though only about 20% of the United States is specifically used for cropland, any given model must run across all the United States area to classify the land. So let's make some assumptions here. So assume that we use Sentinel-2 for land classification at 10 meters resolution, and we get one cloud-free image every two weeks. That's 12 bands. The Sentinel-2 provides us with 12 bands, each of them at two bytes, uh, which is 16 bits per pixel. And this totals up to about 26 images total per 100 square meters. 
this sums up to about 7.5 million square kilometers of, of land to process. And this equals about 44 terabytes of data post-processed to run a predictive model. So that's not trivial. It's a very large data set, although storing this data set um, about a 10 terabyte drive costs about $200 in cloud compute costs. So it's, you know, it's doable. Um, but this is the primary motivation of reducing the resolution as if we reduce the resolution from, from 10 meters to 30 square meters, the data set drops down from 44 terabytes to about five terabytes to work with. So if only using Sentinel-2, roughly about 28 terabytes of raster data must be downloaded and processed over that land since Sentinel-2 tiles are about 110 square kilometers uh, and have 12 bands. So this amounts to roughly 640 megabytes per scene that occur every five days. So that being said, this data scales up very, very quickly, uh, which forces us to adjust our approaches to w work with this data and train models on this data in ways that are efficient and effective. So section two, we're going to be discussing Sentinel-2 optical data and um, some of its ramifications for using it for predicting the cropland data layer. So there are multiple things that can affect both the quality and temporal spacing of satellite data. So some example factors impacting kind of the temporal spacing. Um, there's things like orbit path overlap, uh, which means that as you get closer to the poles, you get more increased coverage just due to how the orbits work. Uh, the orbit path and the image capture repeatability. There's also some variance in in two passes over the same area, just based on um, variance in the orbit locations. And so the exact position of the images can vary east to west, which results in areas on the edges of the scenes that have more uncertainty in coverage. Uh, thick cloud cover can also occur and obscure the view of the Earth, uh, causing data gaps in coverage. And then also the, there's something called the scene classification layer, uh, which identifies if uh, it predicts if a image has significant cloud cover or not. Oftentimes uh, this algorithm has some errors and can be wrong. And so when this prediction is wrong, say it predicts that there's a cloud here when there's really not or vice versa, this can introduce unnecessary gaps in coverage in, in the time series of the data. There's also factors that affect the quality of the imagery as well. So things like thin cloud haze, um, clouds can kind of occur in all different shapes and sizes, including kind of a gradient system. And so sometimes it's hard to identify when the clouds are very thin as they won't appear as kind of thick objects, but it'll just alter the reflectance values uh, as they'll be transparent. So you can see to the earth, uh, you can see the earth's surface, but it will alter kind of the reflectance values that we get back and might not be captured by something like the scene classification layer. Additionally, there's tiling system overlap. So at the edge of tiles, uh, and the tiles is how the data is stored and queried in Sentinel-2, there's overlap in this system and slight differences between the values of the same scene and location at different tiles due to post-processing techniques of the data that Sentinel-2 provides. Geolocation and georeferencing, lastly, um, can also affect the quality of, of our data. So the location of pixels can be incorrect and vary by more than the size of a pixel, resulting in wrong information for any given point location. So here's one example of what kind of the orbit path overlap uh, is for different locations in North America. Normally, uh, if you know, there's no cloud cover, we'll get a Sentinel-2 uh, image every five days. However, there is overlap between adjacent orbits, which increases further from the equator. So thus certain parts of the United States on the borders of orbits get up to two times coverage per satellite and results in intervals of two or three days instead of five. And this occurs as you get closer to the equator. So the orbit path repeatability, this is one visualization and example of that. So even within the distance of one kilometer shown here in the image, the same nominal orbit path has several actual orbit path variations, which can affect the availability of imagery. Each of these red lines in this image showcase uh, one of the edges of the same orbit path. And you can see it varies quite dramatically from uh, orbit to orbit for different dates, even across the same kind of one kilometer uh, location time span. 
So now we'll touch, discuss a little bit on the ramifications of the tile system, which is how Sentinel-2 kind of cuts up its images and locations and cuts up the globe into these different tile sections, which identifies uh, how we can find where an image was taken uh, on the globe. So some considerations to be aware of when we're processing this data using the tile system, that these these scenes are captured from Sentinel-2 are processed and made available using this tile system that's a slightly modified version of this military grid reference system, the MGRS. These tiles can overlap slightly and result in values of the same scene and up to four. There's different georeferencing or calibration for each tiles. The band values for the same scene location in different tiles can be slightly different. So what can happen is, for example, if you have four different Images all within different tiles, a different post processing can be applied to each of these images, which can slightly adjust the image, even though it's the same image, can slightly adjust it based on which tile it was identified um, to be in. And so this can cause some, some noise and duplication of the images in our data set that we'll have to um, process to deduplicate um, and make it so that we can actually input you know, one image per location in the time series. Lastly, the orbit paths and the tiling grid don't line up one to one. Uh, so the Sentinel-2 scenes are much, much larger than tiles. Uh, the swath width of 290 kilometers versus a tile size of about 110 kilometers. The overlap at the edges of orbit paths can cover an entire tile at certain latitudes. Um, and so this is relevant when we're talking about kind of the duplication of images and, tile and scene processing for tile. Um, and it's just something that we have to take into account as we're processing the data uh, for Sentinel-2. So lastly, we're going to discuss briefly the scene classification layer, or the SCL. Um, this, this is another band that's provided uh, is part of the metadata layer for Sentinel-2 imagery, and it's useful for rapid identification of data of interest. While it's not a proper land classification uh, like the cropland data layer, it does facilitate rapid classification of per scene pixels into 12 categories. So some of the most important things that we care about is identification of cloud cover and images so that we can remove them from our time series. There is a separate cloud mask available with probabilities um, using the Send2 core algorithm. And we'll also use it for identifying pixels that contain vegetation in this demo. So the SEL has a 60 meter resolution using a single pixel from a single scene for prediction. Uh, however, there's something useful to note is that this SEL layer can be error prone. Um, so there was a study done by Holstein et al. A research paper to showcase the uh, error rates for different SCL uh, algorithms, including FMAS, Sent2 Core, and Sentinel Hub. Sent2 Core is what we'll be using in this demo. Um, as we can see, there's different classification probabilities between the three. Sen Sen Sentinel Hub actually performs the best for cloud classification um, with 99.4% accurate. Sent2 Core is 97.5% accurate for predicting accurately clouds. Um, but one thing to note here is that it also has a very high misclassification rate for other classes. So things like snow, for example, uh, it has a very high misclassification. If there's snow on the ground, 30% you know, of the time it will classify it as a cloud. 39.2% uh, of the time for F mask, it will classify snows uh, as clouds. Um, so that's just something that can add noise as we're processing this the, the data and trying to clean it up and remove cloud cover that there can be some mispredictions um, using this method that can contribute and add some noise. So here's some common issues and limitations. Um, mentioned the geolocation georeferencing of pixels uh, and for showing the default scene classification labels on the right from providers. Uh, this is an example of the SCL layer from Sentinel-2. These aren't always accurate. So, for example, on the left, we're showing th that there can be inconsistent geolocation of about 10 to 15 minute meter disagreement between subsequent images that are five days apart. And you can see that the uh, images shift uh, about 10 to 15 meters um, between these two images. And on our right, we have poor scene classification of an image that has thin cirrus cloud cover. Um, this particular example 
Um, the SEL can often struggle if the clouds are just thin and wispy. I can often, it's predicting here that there's, you know, definitely uh, farmland here, but it's predicting it as water cover or snow um, or just doesn't know what it is and is misclassifying it as unclassified. And so these types of images can add significant noise as well as we're processing the image and trying to clean it up uh, and remove clouds using the SCL band. So now into section three, we'll talk a little bit about how to actually run this code in Databricks and provide a demo at the end. So an overview of the Databricks Community Edition. Um, Databricks Community Edition, it provides uh, a free environment for working within a Databricks uh, tool. The link to instructions for sign up is, is listed here. You will have to sign it for an account uh, to use Databricks Community Edition. It provides Jupyter style, Jupyter Notebook style coding um, and allows up to 10 gigabytes persistent storage on what they call their file store, where you can store generic files, tables, and, and code uh, in their system. These notebooks are stored in a separate area called the workspace. Within Databricks, you can spin up small instances with two CPUs, 15 gigabytes of RAM, and 130 gigabytes of local storage. And these cloud instances, uh, cloud compute instances have Spark enabled out of the box. And Spark is a well-known cloud computing tool that allows you to work with distributed computing on larger data sets for more efficient workflows. Anything stored in the local machine is lost when the entrance shuts down. So going back to the file store, it's very important that after you're done working uh, in your Jupyter notebooks or Databricks types of notebooks, that you store any data that you would like to keep in your next session into the file store, else anything stored on the local machine will be shut down when that instance shuts down. Uh, another thing to note is that when you're running these notebooks and any code that takes longer than 60 minutes to run will cause the node to shut down automatically and will time out. However, as long as you're interacting with the notebook, you know, writing and running code manually, it will reset that timer and will, the instance will stay up longer. So for example, if you have a script that takes longer than one hour to run, it's recommended to go into maybe like another notebook and execute any command to reset that timer countdown um, so you have another 60 minutes to to run any jobs that you're you're doing so we do provide some code and materials for this demo we'll provide a three data processing scripts for part one including cdl acquisition sentinel 2 acquisition and final data manipulation the code we we uh created it in such a way that it is generalizable to new uh, and other problems. So the CDL table could be any ground truth label uh, and point location and time frame, and the rest of the data acquisition and modeling, including the processing of the Sentinel-2 imagery, can remain the same. So for example, if you had labels on crop health or vegetative stage or any other types of land cover classes, you could replace the CDL processing with, with that to change the, the problem structure. Any systematic error from the CDL will also likely pass the model strain on it. We mentioned this before. So for example, if you were really interested in, in training sorghum, just know that the CDL you know, has a higher error rate for predicting sorghum. Uh, and that error will pass on to any models trained on these labels. To get data as it would exist after running the scripts in this training demonstration, you can download the zip files located with other training materials for this course. And if you want to download any of your files from Databricks to your local system, you can do so by going to the URL and changing this path to the directory path to where your file exists in the file store, and then that will download the file from the Databricks system onto your local machine. So high level overview, the code steps we'll be taking for processing and storing this data. Step one, we'll define areas of interest or AOIs. Step two, we'll acquire the corresponding CDL data for those AOIs. Step three, we'll search and filter for available satellite data. Step four, we'll acquire the corresponding satellite data. And then in step five, we'll rearrange into a parquet file of a satellite band value data into a single row per pixel location and season with columns for time series components in the form of lists of values. So for example, all the band values and scene dates will be in a list format uh, saved as a parquet file. Um, and this is to support kind of the modeling processes that will and the, and the pipelines that we'll develop in part two and part three. 
I should note that Parquet file is a well-known uh, file sy format system for efficiently storing larger uh, data sets uh, that has more support um, than, say, something like a CSV, which has very low efficiency for, for storing very large amounts of data. In this demo, we'll also be working with a couple of APIs. So in place of manually retrieving data, APIs make data acquisition and processing significantly more scalable by providing a consistent interface to search for and retrieve large amounts of data via web requests. And so we'll rely on two APIs in this demo for data acquisition. The first API is the CDL API from NASGEO data to get the CDL uh, labels. And then we'll also use the AWS Stack API for Sentinel-2 imagery searches. Uh, the Sentinel-2 image raster data can be downloaded via a web URL download links that we can access directly once we know, uh, once known from the imagery search that we'll conduct. So since these are large, uh, they will slow down processing. So we'll do our best to minimize the downloading of any superfluous or low impact scenes as this is the bulk of the data processing um, that we'll do in this, in this course. So the first step I mentioned, we have to create an area of interest or an AOI uh, for the areas that we're interested in training the model on. So the only prior step is defining these AOIs. We'll, we use the uh, NAS Geodata web GUI to draw seven boxes of area of interest that we're interested in, and then export them as Esri shape files. Then we convert them into bounding boxes using the left, bottom, right, and top uh, latitude and longitude coordinates, and then convert it into the EPSG 5070 C, uh, coordinate reference system. And this is just a requirement by the NAS Geo Data API. Uh, we provide these bounds already in the CDL acquisition code, so you won't have to necessarily reprocess this um, for this course, but if you wanted to get you know, different area of interests, uh, you could follow the same process uh, to get these bounds. So here's some example Python code to get the bounds from the, the zipped Esri shape files from NAS Geo that we get from the web GUI. Um, ultimately, what it boils down to is we'll get the list of the file paths for the downloaded shapefile boundaries, which are zip files. We'll read those shapefiles into a GeoPandas data frame and then append those data frames to a list so that we end up with a list of geo data frames that contain the shapefile information from uh, the zipped uh, shapefiles. And then we'll concatenate all of those data frames into one single large GeoPandas data frame that contains all the boundaries of the area of interest that we're interested in and convert them into the uh, coordinate reference system as specified as necessary by the NASGEO API for, to prepare for the acquisition of the cropland data layer uh, data for those AOIs. So now we'll get into the CDO acquisition code and just a summary. Um, the results of the first part are spatially downsampled version of the CDL for the user specified AOE, AOIs that we just generated. This code part executes pretty rapidly in only a few minutes and results in a parquet table with a single 30 meter square pixel a year per row with associated CDL estimate. So for each year that we're interested in and for each of the AOIs, we'll get the cropland data layer predictions from this API. And this is a kind of a summary table uh, of the, the data that we get in part one for the from the CDL API. Uh, we can see the top five CDL categories across all of our areas of interest that we pull, and as well as the percentage of entire data set per year that each CDL category represents. So for example, in 2021, the soybeans represented approximately 36.6% .6 of the land cover for that year. And we can see stats for the other crop types um, for these area of interest in years uh, in this table as well. So now that we have the CDL labels, we can acquire the Sentinel-2 imagery that we'll use for training to predict the cropland data layer label. So for each of these pixel years from the satellite, uh, from the cropland data layer acquisition code, we will acquire the associated Sentinel-2 data for that entire year and saves the data into a parquet table. This part is the bulk of the data processing that will be performed for the series, and it takes quite a long time to execute. Um, by a long time, we mean longer than an hour. So note that 
if you let this running, it will time out the free version of Databricks. And so to reset that timer, you can run uh, manually some code in another notebook just to reset that timer so that this can process in the Databricks community edition without timing out. Note that um, due to the previously discussed tile overlap uh, and post-processing techniques that Sentinel-2 um, does to the imagery, there will be duplicate images for the same tile. And there's an example of this where there's two rows, each containing one pixel worth of imagery for aligned with the cropland data layer label, um, taken on the same date um, in the same tile. Uh, it's two images with slightly different values. And so we do need to do a strategy um, to deduplicate the images to reduce the noise in the time series and make it better modeling. Uh, make a better data set, clean up the duplications for b before we train for modeling. The results here uh, results in 123 rows totally, total available for this particular pixel and year. Um, each row includes the band values for that location from a single scene and date. So the band values, there's 12 band values for Sentinel-2, including kind of blue, green, red, red edge, etc. And this contains all of the pixel values that we, we could pull from the Sentinel-2 and available from the Sentinel-2 satellite, as well as the associated label. And so we can use this to uh, design our data loader to prepare to use these band values and structure it in a time series format to then finally predict uh, the cropland data layer prediction for this location and year. So we can plot the results of the Sentinel-2 acquisition code um, here using the same NDVI signature across a growing season. Given this plot, we can clearly see that there are errors in the scene classification layer uh, that we discussed before. So for example, um, it's there's clearly an error in classification where it's predicting a topographical casted shadow, which we know in this area, this is just farm fields and there's no topographic things that would cause uh, casted shadows. Um, so this is likely caused by other things such as like cloud shadows or other errors in the system. We can also see the issue of the duplicate data showing up in this time series, uh, where these two values are very close together on the same image or the same date. Um, and so we need to handle uh, the duplication of values, deduplicate it before we uh, plug this data into a model training system. And then lastly, again, um, there's error in classification in the, in the scene classification layer where it's predicting not vegetated areas where this area is very clearly vegetated using the NDVI um, values. We can, we can clearly see this is a vegetated uh, date. Um, and so just to note again, um, that there are errors in the SCL that can cause noise even after um, processing the data that we will have to, to further clean up uh, before we enter the model training phase. So lastly, the last step we do to the data after we acquired the crapland data layer and the uh, Sentinel-2 images and the pixels per crapland data layer label, uh, we will finally combine all available scenes into a single row for each pixel year. Um, so instead of having one row being one pixel uh, for one location, we will concatenate all of the time series of images into a list of values from the scenes for each row, including the band, tile, image dates, and SCL value, uh, concatenating them all into to one row. And then these list of values are then converted into binary strings for more efficient storage, eliminating the list data type and commas for everything except for the tiles column. Um, so we do this so it's more efficiently being stored, and this also makes it easier to read in this file, uh, this data format when we're working with TensorFlow datasets in part two. So the results of this um, grouping, it means for each pixel uh, with 123 scenes, we would have 123 uh, by 12 values in the list in the bands column. So 123 dates. Each date has 12 pixel values associated with it. And so this will be stored kind of in this bands in bytes format and then stored into parquet format, ready to be ingested into a TensorFlow data set, which we'll do in part two. 
So with that, I'll hand over the presentation to John, who will give a demo of the code and that can be run in Databricks. Thank you, Eric. So as I jump into the tutorial or the demo part, I'd like to first start out just quickly going to the, the place where we drew boundaries for this demo to show people what it looks like. The links were in the slide. Here you can come to Cropscape and within Cropscape, you have the option to uh, use some of their tools to draw boundaries. Um, certainly this isn't the only way, but it was a fast way to do this, especially because our data source is coming from the CDL and you can look at the CDL overlaid on the map when you're drawing the boundaries. So uh, we are actually focused on the lower Mississippi Delta for this tutorial because of crop diversity. So I'm just zooming in here, but it, it will refine the resolution as you zoom in. And again, you can go in, uh, you can zoom in as much as you want and draw your boundaries and then uh, once you have them drawn, there's the options to export them. So uh, you can see export area of interest after drawing your boundary. And this is this is all we did. So uh, then you can use the code also to extract them. And um, just note it's in EPSG uh, 5070. It's not 4326, which is uh, not, in other words, it's not latitude longitude. So, all right. Uh, let's move on to Databricks. So in Databricks, we have the main page you will see when you first get into it. Uh, here, it's giving you options to import data, create a notebook. Um, they also have a, a guide, like a, a tutorial. Um, it's it's really not uh, a bad idea if you want to go through this really quick to look at this uh, in case you uh, you know forget what we discussed or you have questions. Um, because we do not do a comprehensive uh, discussion around uh, Databricks uh, itself. We we are just trying to show how to use the tool to uh, do what we're intending to do. But there's more functionality within here than what obviously we are using. So uh, it's a great tool and we encourage you to explore that. Um, if you are to create a notebook, uh, it's going to look just like a Jupyter notebook. So, uh, and I'm going to jump in some of the ones we created here. And then also, uh, we typically don't upload data via this. We'll go into catalog and then DBFS, which is the uh, DBFS is Databricks file system or file storage. And so this is the persistent storage. It's not on a temporary cluster. Um, also note that if you want to get any work done, you're going to need to start up a cluster that again, in the quick start guide, they'll teach you that. But here you can see uh, if you come to right here, compute, it will take you to this particular look page. It should look something like this. And within this, you can create a uh, compute. And so if, if I were to do this, it will give me the option to uh, enter a computer name. There's not really much other options you can specify here with the community edition. So you don't need to worry about configuration too much. If you have a uh, an actual uh, uh, subscription to Databricks, there, there are many options here. So, all right, with that, we'll jump into part one. I'm actually going to take you through four, uh, well, three parts and then a final uh, data quality check, uh, so to speak, on, on some of our process data. Um, and we'll probably spend most of the time in part one where we acquire the CDL data. Uh, I have a lot of code there to visualize it. And then part two, uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit less time, part three, even less time, and then we'll finalize uh, some of the uh, this discussion with plots in our quality check scripts. So, all right, with that, we'll jump into the first one. This, I have some notes in here. I try to put comments so that you can see uh, what each part of the code is doing. And uh, we also provide some links where relevant so you can go and look for yourself um, uh, at some of our sources. But uh, this, this really starts out, most notebooks are gonna start out with some type of uh, pip install. We're working in Python, um, and then we'll we'll jump into imports. Uh, you'll see the imports for the notebook. I try not to, uh, or we generally try not to import things down further into the notebooks. We try to do all the imports up top, so you see what's needed. Um, just note that you want to run this first because if you don't run this and then you come back and try to run it, it will uh, kind of restart your notebook. And you'll lose um, 
you, it, it kind of flushes your memory out, so you would lose anything that you loaded. Uh, so uh, with that, um, we'll have some helper functions here. Most of these are going to be around um, geospatial functions and web requests uh, and a couple other things that are useful um, from PySpark. So because uh, that's the main uh, reason why we're using Databridge here is it supports PySpark and it works really well for querying and working with large data tables. So I have a few helper, fun helper functions I, I first specify. Uh, these helper functions are um, needed for, uh, some of them are needed for visualization, some, some of them are needed for actually uh, getting the data. So they're actually querying APIs. This particular one, um, I'll just walk you through this. I tried to put notes here. But things like this, which match the color scheme for the CDL, uh, allow us to uh, make some nice plots later on. And so, again, you can kind of see how we are getting these uh, these things. We use we, as much as possible. We use functions that can uh, just grab data off the web. So this is this particular file comes from NAS Geo. Uh, and then as we uh, go down here, we're going to see uh, some helper functions again. That this is uh, primarily. Um, Hitting the uh, this is well doing the the majority of the work to get the uh, the uh, it's doing the query to the API the NAS Geo API for CDL data. So when we send a query to it, uh, it has certain requirements uh, or needs the to see a bounding box and a you know for instance a year um, because between those two things you can get CDL data. Um, CDL data is a once per year thing. So. If I we have some defaults that we put in here, so if you just call this, you will get back uh, that data in a certain format. Um, of course, this this uh, we try to put notes. It comes back as a as a bunch of bytes, um, and it's really a TIFF file, but it's a bunch of bytes. So you need to do some conversions there to actually see it as a an image, and we'll show how to do that later in this file um, or in this notebook. Uh, again, these are some helper functions. It, it may not be clear what these are doing, but it, it allows some manipulation to the data for plotting uh, and sampling. Um, and, and again, we, we try to put some notes. That this is the helper function sec section of the, uh, the code. Um, as we come down here, you know, again, we try to title these appropriately. Um, this some functions to, to plot the data and get statistics. Um, Again, this is useful for uh, quality checking, making sure, especially if you're trying to train models, you want to make sure that you have a, a fairly um, evenly sampled data set. It's not too skewed towards one class. Uh, this is something you're going to want to check uh, as you sample your data. Um, then again, some plotting functions. Uh, actually, within Databricks, Databricks has some very nice plotting functions. Um, and they actually, I believe, use Plotly, which is an interactive tool. It's a very nice tool in the background for some of their work. But uh, for spatial plots and some some complex image plots, um, they don't really have as many uh, tools directly. So uh, we we do create a few different functions in here to help plot some of the images. And then this is finally a function to help uh, read the uh, bytes of a of an image. So. Um, if if you have questions on this, uh, you know you can put them in the chat. But this is something that uh, we we really feel that it's better to try it out and play around with it, um, and and maybe get a feel for what it's doing. So, all right. Um, so moving on down, um, and I try to put notes that this was primarily for if something was primarily for debugging or getting info. So uh, here we get into the visualizing uh, of the AOI. So we've drawn these boundaries. We uh, actually define them here. I've copied and pasted some of these boundaries um, in a certain format. These are just the min, max, lat, lawns, and then we're gonna we're gonna use those along with. Um, so these are for this bbox uh, list and the years are for training data. This is for a, the the test data. Um, we come down here and I actually call the, some functions very quickly to view the data to see what's in there. So in this case, I just use the first boundary and I use the year 2018 and I get some CDL data back. And what we do is we look at some box plots and and some uh, an actual map of that. 
Uh, and these are all interactive. So the functions that the helper functions defined above allow you to create an interactive map uh, similar to what you would see on the 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 uh, CROS website where it's, you have the interactive cropland data layer uh, available. So again, this is all plotly in the back end. But we can see some statistics about what types of crops are in there. In this case, I'm ignoring anything less than 1% to clean this up. And you know, we can see there's a quite a diversity here with soybeans, rice, corn, and, and other things. Um, as we move on down, uh, again, um, we kind of look at, in this case, uh, the what I'm calling the test data set, where it's a very dense area of various crops. Um, we're getting this for one year, 2019. And again, I want to look at the the diversity or the distribution of crops here so that when we do test the final model, um, we know that we're testing it across a broad range of different uh, classes. Um, okay, as we move on from there, uh, what we want to do is we're actually going to end up uh, subsampling a lot of our data because these boundaries that we create, we want to draw large boundaries to get sampling over a large area. But uh, if we were to actually densely uh, sample that and, and acquire Sentinel-2 data for it, it would be too much data to work with on Databricks um, community. So we, and, and really for most people on their laptops for a demo. So we wanted to make that a little bit uh, more lightweight, even though it will scale, the methods here will scale to very large data. So in this case, um, I have a function to sample the roster and we have an interval uh, that you can specify how much you sample it by. So this will uh, generally space it out evenly, both um, in the horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, so this is just a default interval of three, and this is pixels. Um, and then again, some supporting functions for that subsampling is uh, uh, provided right here. So uh, here I actually show a plot of what that looks like to subsample. And uh, the intention here is this may look kind of uh, interesting in, in terms of how these lines, these black lines are here, but what this plot is intending to do is show you how it's been subsampled. So if I were to zoom in, and it's important to view your data to make sure whatever your code is, you would think it's doing, that it's doing it the way you intend. If I zoom in here, what we see is that indeed, if I've specified an interval of three, I see that actually being happening. So uh, what I've done here is I've, I've basically blacked out all the pixels that didn't get sampled, and the ones that did get sampled are given their you know original uh, CDL value. So if I zoom in even further, it can be seen very clearly that that subsampling of three pixels was uh, 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 effective at doing what we intended to do. So here we have uh, one sampled and then two ignored, and that's in both the horizontal and vertical direction. Um, and then, of course, we can reset the axes on this uh, with this. So the, the nice part about these uh, interactive plots is we can kind of zoom in and check things like that. Um, I also zoom in uh, on this in a different way. I wanted to uh, look essentially at the extents of the original data, um, making sure we were, again, subsampling correctly over the entire um, interval. And uh, here's here's again an, an example of that. It's just another way to view the above, but it was instead focusing on latitude and long, longitude instead of just the image plot, uh, which is why you see it like that. So um, again, this uh, this is maybe not so clear what was happening, but uh, we were trying to view the uh, the AOI, the boundary that we drew in latitude, longitude, and kind of looking at the subsampling over that. So that's why it's kind of uh, warped like this. It's not, it's it's in latitude and longitude. All right, uh, now, you know, we've verified that our functions work and now we wanna actually, you know, scale this. So uh, here I, I just simply use the function defined above that we know works to retrieve data over our boundaries and years. Um, this is for the training and test data. So uh, we get the data, this is now a list of bytes. Now we're going to then uh, quickly come down here. We don't use this, even though this function is available to analyze some of the statistics. Uh, we don't use that, but here we can come down and actually plot again uh, one area, just, just the first boundary first year. Um, and what we're doing here is we're actually uh, taking this and uh, eventually subsampling to an interval of 10. So, I. 
this doesn't have the spacing between. It just shows again, double checking that as we expand out our subsampling, it's still doing what we intend. And it did. It 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 very coarsely sampled one of these areas. Um, so from there, uh, we actually end up uh, scaling this even more um, to uh, write this out. So uh, in this case, um, again, we can see the interval is set to ten. But what we're going to do here is we're going to, well, the default interval is set to 10, but we're going to essentially run this over all our data now. So we've actually got the full rosters available, the full byte strings of the data, but now we need to subsample it and then write it out to tables. And so that's what we do here. Um, now we do it with the, with the test data set first. That one, we densely sample it because it's a very small area um, and we want to have some nice plots at the end. And so we sample that, then we uh, write the results of that um, after we, well, after we sample it, um, it via this function, and then we read it back in and make sure that it, this is just a check to make sure that it wrote properly. So we see about 15,000 rows. And uh, so that, that seems very reasonable. Um, same thing here, except now we are going to loop through all the training data and we move to a sample interval of 15 to be very coarse because again, we want to limit the data significantly over a very large area. So we have seven different boundaries. We tried to give a very large area and in turn to limit the data, we have to subsample. Um, and then finally, again, we read the, the uh, data that was written out um, back in and we do a couple pivots on the table to see that the, the data looks all right. Um, and that's where we're looking at right now, again, a table. Uh, based on some different uh, years and um, you know the the crop type and the percentages that were available for those uh, different classes. And if you'd like, the nice part about Databricks, I'll show this later, is that you can actually add a visualization if you'd like. Um, and so if you wanted to see a bar plot of some variable or a histogram of something, um, you you could do that. Uh, so as an example, if I were to drop in a particular uh, column. It would then try to make a plot of that in this case that it's not doing anything, but um, you would be able to des decide how, if you play around with this, you'll get a preview of how it would look if you tried it. So um, just know that's a nice feature uh, in Databricks that you can, you can utilize. All right, and then, uh, so as we move down again, some more advanced pivoting or window functions to view the data, and that concludes this script. So, uh, at the end, we just kind of verify that it processed correctly. All right, so now that data will exist and that data will exist within uh, our DBFS system, as I mentioned before. Uh, the way I've set it up is to uh, write out to one of these files. So we'd have the dense test, as I mentioned, and then the subsampled CDL for training and validation of models. Um, and so you could, you will be able to see something similar to this if you're in the D, the DataBridge file store after you run our code. It, it only takes a few minutes to run. It's a very quick running code. And if you were to dive into it, you'll see that actually a Parquet file is not a file, but a set of folders based on partitions. And then you finally have some files way back here that are uh, what, what are the actual Parquet files. And these are dot .parquet. So, um, all right, so that's part one. Uh, now we have our CDL data, but we need to get uh, satellite imagery associated with that. So we move to the acquisition code for that. Um, this is in, uh, increasing complexity. There's a, also a lot of uh, places when you're acquiring Sentinel-2 data to uh, possibly make a mistake, especially when doing it at scale. So uh, this code took a lot of time to write. Um, it's just a note that you know you may not understand everything that's in this code right away uh, because it's quite complex and there's subtleties to it that are important to uh, just just know that if you change something um, it could impact your data quality. Uh, there's there's just there's subtle things that can that have have taken a while to work out and uh, so we provide this to you as is and uh, it's it. Just note that it is on you to double check that it's doing what you expect it to do. Uh, we believe we worked out most of the bugs, but um, uh, yeah, we, we want to make sure as a disclaimer, you know that, hey, uh, always double check your data after processing it to make sure it's what you uh, think it is. So uh, as mentioned, 
uh, when we start this code, we're going to uh, install different packages and then import the, 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 what we need here um, to do the processing. Uh, again, mostly spatial libraries. Um, we're not doing a lot of plotting in this particular file. This is just mainly for processing. And one thing that I'm going to highlight here is we do multi-processing. We don't use PySpark to do the processing because uh, I found it to be quite um, uh, uh, unstable for the the goal of when you want to actually parallel process uh, with very unique functions, and that's what we do here. So here we just rely on Python standard multi-process processing functions. Um, so as we go down here, um, <clears throat> we do have a couple helper functions that, uh, like we did in the last file. This one particularly. Uh, deals with the fact that, uh, again, NAS Geo data that we got, um, it, the, it likes to, the, the API, uh, it dealt with 5070. Um, our bounds, therefore, are in 50 EPS uh, G5070, and we want to convert those bounds to 4326 when we're uh, doing searches. This, we still use the bounds that we originally defined when we're doing the imagery searches instead of the points, uh, because, um, just it's a it's a it's a quick way to uh, easily do our um, uh, kind of searches for scenes. It uh, maybe a better way to do this that someone could come up with is, uh, and it wouldn't be too hard to do, is to take uh, the Sentinel two tiling system and group all your data ahead of time from the CDL into tiles, and then do the processing. But here we don't do that. We just we just use the bounds we originally defined uh, to do our imagery searches. Okay, so here's the, uh, the the actual query function we use. This is how we get uh, Sentinel-2 data uh, back. In, well, in the sense of when we're looking for what's out there. So we want to know what's available. And we use this stack API that's uh, essentially at this location right here. Uh, it's provided via AWS. Um, it's open to everyone. So you don't have to have an AWS account, and that's the advantage of Sentinel-2 data here is, is the availability of it. These are cloud-optimized geotiffs that essentially uh, are, are made available. So this, this returns the available cloud-optimized geotiffs, and it also gives you links to those files. So uh, the, the, we end up being able to just download them via web request, which is a very nice feature, and it scales very nicely uh, so it's open to all, um, and, uh, and, and it works really well at scale. All right. Um, as mentioned, we do, uh, we do kind of chunk the data in this case, um, by bounding boxes in years. Uh, it just makes it more manageable when we're doing our imagery searches. So we're going to have some target, um, time frame at, when we do an imagery search and some target area when we do a scene, uh, well, imagery or scene search. And so the way we've chunked this is again by the bounding boxes and by the years. And we've just defined the time frame as being uh, from you know the 1st of January to December 31st of a given year. So if the year is 2019, we uh, search for the entire year for the available scenes from Sentinel-2. And, and those are what we're gonna process. Um, so there's some helper functions here. Uh, to to split that in, that data apart, it's it's actually it's first getting the data from the CDL paths uh, that we just mentioned, you know, the ones in the Databricks file store, and then we're going to uh, split that up and decide how to how to for loop it. All right, um, moving down, uh, this is an asset list of what we're going to get from uh, the uh, what we're actually going to download and process uh, for files. This, I got this, these are actual, these names uh, are important to keep uh, as they are. They are the same strings used by the Stack API to uh, uh, denote their assets. Um, and then here, uh, I put a reference. We are not going to process any, we're not going to get data from any pixels that have, uh, you know, no, they're, they're missing data or there's a saturated pixel. It's unclassified. Uh, there's high cloud cover uh, or high probability of cloud cover, or if there's snow or ice, uh, we ignore all of those. But the rest of these, we are going to get allow data to come through for. All right. So uh, one note here, we made this code efficient so that uh, again, uh, as noted by Eric, these clusters will only stay up for a certain amount of time. Um, after 60 minutes of running a particular uh, uh, cell, the cluster will shut off. I do have a cluster on right now. You can see it's green. Um, 
you know, that 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 may shut off earlier if I'm not using anything than an hour. But if you just strictly are for looping or processing one cell, it will shut off after an hour. So uh, because of that, if we want to restart this, we want to get all our existing data and not reprocess that. We want to actually start from where we ended. So this function allows us to do that. And so uh, that's there. And then, um, you know, a little bit, to, we want to monitor that we're not getting too much data. So I have a function to check the data size. Um, again, this is really focused on uh, the, I can do, I can actually run this right now to see what size the dense data is, but this was focused on the dense data set. So it's only point, it's only a, uh, 0.2 gigabytes, not too much data um, right now from uh, the actual CDL data. Uh, and this is after having um, processed the the Sentinel two data. For so this is this is a uh, this is showing what what exists in the file right now because I've already run this code. And just note that if you were to run this code for the I have two different file paths here. If you run it for the train test data. Um, you will never be able to finish it. In, I mean, it would take days and days of rerunning your script because uh, there's so much data. But for the test data set, because it's small, um, and that's the one I have specified, you should in one or two runs be able to complete uh, the processing of that data uh, within this within this script. So it should be able to acquire all the Sentinel-2 data available for that particular boundary. Um, all right, uh, as I come down here, um, we have some uh, deduplication of scene IDs. Again, it's it's something to uh, el primarily eliminate um, uh, what we believe to be uh, reprocessed scenes. Um, so we want to eliminate the original one and, and get the get the most up to date one. And then finally, we get to the 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 real meat, the real engine of this, and that's the uh, uh, the loop to retrieve and sample the Sentinel two data. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail on this because it's quite complicated. Uh, suffice to note, it does rely heavily on roster IO um, and it is using multiprocessing to, to try and move as fast as possible. There's only two cores on this particular uh, data bridge instance. If you have a larger machine, um, because we aren't really relying on Spark here, you should be able to easily uh, you know, take this code and just change a few file path uh, pointers and you know, be able to run this on your local machine. And that's the way we intended it. This part that would really be the most important part to scaling and where we don't use Databricks or uh, we don't use PySpark at least, can be run on other resources. Um, so we have one function to sample the GeoTIFFs. Um, and then we have this, this other function that kind of more generally speaking is helping eliminate, um, as I mentioned, certain bands or certain, I shouldn't say bands, but uh, certain, classes within the scene classification layer, like dense clouds. Um, it's it's uh, not even, it's for scenes that don't have a lot of valid area, it's not even bothering with them. Uh, so it does a lot of the work here to, um, again, just uh, make sure we have a clean data set in the end, sample it as fast as possible so that we have a, a highly scalable uh, data processing pipeline, and then eventually it writes it out uh, into the Parquet files. So, and then this ultimately, it, it, it writes them out into certain partitions so that in the end you have one kind of big parquet file and you can query that and I'll show how to do that um, in the last step. But uh, this, is, uh, this is really intended to scale and it, and it works very well. So um, yeah, it, once you run it, you will see some output below. If you do see errors like this, don't worry too much about it. Generally, you'll see it something along the lines of it's starting a worker and then it'll tell you the scene that it's processing, the idea of the scene. It'll tell when it started and it'll tell you when it finished. And so you kind of track progress as time goes on. Um, in this particular case, uh, you know, I just, I actually reran this and started where it left off and it finished up real quickly. So this is the kind of output you see, so. All right, uh, with that, after you're done with that, you will have in your data store or your Databridge file store, you will be able to see something like this, where we have uh, what I call an S2 sample, that's how I've labeled it. And then under here, there's a few different files. Uh, we'll have the uh, the S2 sample. This is the training and test data, which again, um, is so big that you're probably uh, not going to be able to run it here, 
but we will, uh, in part two, we will upload a zip file with all of that. We'll make that available to everyone. We'll upload the zip file and just unzip it so it's all available. But the dense one you could probably finish. And and if I were to drill into this again, we'll see that there's a partition on the bounding box, and then there's a partition on the year, and then there's a partition on the tiles. And then we get to, uh, from there, um, we see here with that uh, there's a bunch of scenes available in each of these tiles. In this particular case, it was uh, two different reprocessings of the same tile, but uh, there shouldn't be much overlap in dates between these two. So uh, like as an example, we wouldn't expect because 11, 12 was one of the reprocess dates, we won't see that available here. So it's deduplicated that. Okay. All right, moving on to part three. Um, and this is the final step in the processing. The intention of this is really not to, we don't get any more data at this point. We just manipulate it so that it's 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 friendly for modeling. So we're moving it into more of a time series format. As we mentioned, we're dealing with a regularly spaced time series. So uh, because of that, there's an uncertain amount of uh, available imagery for each pixel location that, that we have from the CDL each year. Um, and so we need something that's very flexible uh, uh, according to that. And, and most of the time that's something like a list. Um, so we, we do utilize list to a point, but we actually end up converting to byte strings ultimately. Um, and that ends up being the, the format that we use. So if I scroll down here, this particular part that's, that's uh, commented out will become useful in part two when we actually extract the uh, train and test data. And uh, well, if if we want to do that, we would need to unzip it. And so um, we'll provide zip files, but we also provide code to unzip files. Uh, so that that's commented out, but it's available here. And then we have, um, as typical, the import functions. And then moving right into this, it's a very it's. I mean, really, we jump right into the the, the meat of this code. That this is a very complicated piece of code. Uh, again, it's really not something um, you should touch until you're really comfortable with it. But there's certain parts that you, I mean, you could probably add some things in if you once you understand it. But it does it does quite a bit, and it's really it's using functions that are um, not what what are typically seen in Python. They're uh, they're PySpark specific things like create map array, um, and and so we're ultimately uh, I'll walk you through what we're doing, but what this code does is it first uh, it first pulls all the bands for uh, any given pixel location. Oh well, for any given row, it pulls all the bands from that row in, into a single column array. So each row currently um, from step two, each row is just a single pixel on a single date where we sampled a a scene. And so we'll have 12 band values. We'll have a scene classification value. For that, we'll have also um, some type of you know CDL label and an image date, things like this. So what we do is we got to pull all those band values together. Uh, we got to group them together into a single um, list or or array. Uh, so that's that's for one date. Um, after that, we also create a dictionary. So we have an image date and then the array of band values, uh, bands one through twelve, uh, and the scene classification layer available for that. So. That's what that's doing. It's it's just create a dictionary. So that's step two. Step three. Now we need to start moving towards uh, some type of time series format because that's only we only right now have it as a single date. We need to have each row contain multiple dates and and therefore uh, essentially we have a lot of data. If we're talking about an entire year, oftentimes that could that could mean you know forty. Uh, 50 different um, uh, uh, actual scenes that were sampled from, um, depending on uh, what was blocking it or where it was located, if there was overlap with a, another uh, satellite pass, but we need to group that all into one single row. And so uh, the bands are all grouped into one column. So it's essentially a list of lists. So each, as mentioned, we're going to eventually end up with something that um, each sub list is 12 bands, and then the entire list is, you know, the different scenes. And so uh, then we'll have image dates associated with each of those um, those those sub lists, tiles, etc. Um, 
we also make sure to sort those in ascending order so that we, it's, a, a, it's a time series. Otherwise, if we don't have that order, um, the, the, what we're intending to do with time series modeling would uh, be more difficult. So, and essentially we don't get to take advantage of the, the time series structure. So that's one thing that happens here as well. And again, it's a bit complicated how that happens, but we end up sorting based on the image dates and then using the indices of that sort to sort all the other data like the bands and the tiles and things like this. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, we look to convert these into more standard formats. Lists are a very uh, unusual format to store data uh, at scale in, so we move them to byte strings for more efficient storage and uh, standard loading by data loaders uh, wherever possible, and then we write to Parquet. And uh, that's that's essentially what this code does, is I'm just scrolling down to show you what's in here, but just note um, that it's, it's not necessarily going to be entirely obvious uh, outside of the comments for, for many of you, and don't feel too intimidated by this. The code has been tested to run. Um, it works really well, it's very robust, and I, I don't see a lot of problems from this. Um, and just note, it's not really adding anything new to the data, it's simply just reformatting it for modeling later. Um, so uh, essentially that's the function to do all the work, and then down here we have, uh, you know, we're, we're the, just simply we're, we're dealing with loops of data. So we're, we're looping through, in this case, again, the different bounty boxes and years for the training data set. Um, and there's only one bounding box in year for the test data set. So, um, and then finally, so we get to, we go down here, we, we, uh, we do eliminate any uh, existing um, uh, partitions from reprocessing again, uh, in case we need, in case you were restarting this script because it took too long. And then there's just a for loop to run the code. So again, we're just calling that function with uh, some very simple input and output um, links and then a, uh, a file, so, or, or a partition, I should say. All right, so that's that. Uh, now, after you've run all this, um, you will have something in your uh, Databricks file store that looks something like, I'll show you the output of the final, it'll be something like this. So we have seven different bounding boxes. Within each of these bounding boxes, there'll be different years available. Um, in this case, I think I didn't run this all the way through. So you'll see some of these only have two years, but we actually have three years uh, in, in the final zip file uh, for all of these, uh, because this is the training data set. So as we go through the partitions, we have bounty box year, and then we, we don't have CDL as a partition in the final one. This, this is how we did it. This is an earlier one. So you will see at this point, you will actually see uh, the, the data not the CDL as a as a partition. So, um, but you will have something like that. And again, that's that's in a format where for part two, we can show you how to how to create data loaders that are going to take advantage of the time series format. Then, so, all right. And then I wanted to show finally what you can do uh, to view this. And again, this leverages some of the strengths of Databricks. It it has some very nice uh, abilities to query the data and also plot it. With interactive plots right in the uh, the 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 GUI itself. So, uh, typical imports um, here uh, at the top, and then again we'll make this code available to everyone. But to show you what it does, um, we want to mainly focus right now on the processing after part two. Part as I, as I mentioned, part three um, has the exact same data just in a different format. So we could write a few different. Uh, 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 functions to do the same thing we're going to do here um, with uh, the part two data. It's just a different, a couple different functions uh, to view the data. So first we read in the data. Uh, when you do read in the data, it looks something like this. And I'll run this because uh, it'll keep my cluster alive. And hopefully during this live demo, it works. But if I run this, it doesn't take too long usually. Uh, you'll see the Spark job run. And the nice part about Spark is you can kind of see here how long it took me to run each part of my code. So uh, we load the dense data, uh, the dense test data, and this is again this is for the output from part two. And so now I have this. If I wanted to, I have a function here also to convert to NDVI because it's a nice way to view. Uh, so we actually add a column for NDVI. So, um, but 
uh, one function you're going to want to know really well is just the display function. So you can display that particular Parquet file that you just loaded. So when I run this, it's actually going to, I'm not going to run it here. It just, it takes like 30 seconds, but um, what you're going to see is output is a table just like this. And so uh, it'll pl plot up to a certain number of rows, depends on how many columns you have too. Here it plotted 10,000 rows. Um, but you can kind of scroll across and look at your data and actually you can sort it by whatever you want to sort it by too. So if I want to sort the column, I can sort it ascending or descending. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do in this case. Uh, I believe it's probably the first 10,000 rows are all from the, the same date uh, so in this case. So we're not really seeing a, a difference. Um, you can sort it by CDL. Um, so in this case, you know, we could see, again, we could see the data however we want to see it, I guess. Um, we could sort it by lat lawn, et cetera. All right, so uh, as you can see this, uh, as, and as we saw earlier, the, the test data set actually has a lot of different prop types in it. So um, we're gonna take this and we're gonna view some of these. Uh, we're gonna pick, a, these are actually, um, you know, each of these is a specific date and a specific pixel. But what we want to view is I actually, so this particular pixel, this is the center point of a CDL pixel. I want to see all the data. I want to see all the data from one of these pixels. I don't want to just see one. I just, I don't want to see a table of band values. I want to see uh, a time series of maybe NDVI. So what I do is I use this NDVI function up here and I have a function down here to display the table of data for one pixel. So I picked out one, pixel. In this case, it was one that was cotton. And so what I did was I I took the original data frame and I used a dot where, and dot where is essentially a filter. So I'm filtering for primarily this pixel. Now, likely I don't need to add in, in this case, uh, I, actually I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to add in these other factors, like it's cotton and it's, you know, this year. I put these here just to, you know, for a reminder, but because this is only one year and because the, this pixel is unique, um, you're going to get the same results if you had that just that pixel. And then at the end, I do a dot with column, which essentially adds a column on the end where I can also run a function on each of the rows. And so this function is that NDVI function, and we call this a UDF, a user-defined function in PySpark. And this will, will, this will create uh, NDVI values. And so, that's what we have now. I'm just viewing this single pixel. I have 37 rows. So I had 37 scenes, unique scenes that I sampled from on unique dates uh, for this particular uh, pixel. And you can kind of sort by date here. And um, then we can see how this how this looks as we go down here. And the, at the very end, I have my additional column and DVI that I can view. Now, the nice part is I don't have to create a, a visualization from code. I can actually just uh, add one. And I did that already right here, but I'll show you how that works again, just by, if I take this, I can just click on visualization and I can click on the type of visualization I want to use. So I could go to scatter plot. I could choose that I want to actually plot by scene date. And then for the column on the Y, I want, I want NDVI. And here we can see it actually generates that plot for me as a preview. Um, now it, it lacks something that I want and I want to color by this scene, I want to actually color it by the scene classification layer, and that's the group by column. So once I do that, I just save this, and it adds that column in, or that visualization in, and it's interactive. Again, you can highlight it, and it'll show you the value, the date, you know, stuff like that. You can zoom in if you'd like, or or whatever. But uh, that's it. it's as easy as that to create plots in Databricks. All right, so. This is also allowing us to confirm that our data was processed correctly. So as I look at, you don't know this from this dot here, but uh, if we were to go back to part uh, two and we were to look at some of the scene classification values, we'd see that a value of five is not vegetated, a value of four is vegetated. So if I go here and look at this, well, I see just what I would expect. A value of four, if I select this uh, off, it'll it'll remove it, but yeah, I see right here around July that we start to see vegetation forming. And for this particular crop, it's actually cotton. That seems about right for that area. And then it's unvegetated outside of that. And there's a few others. These blue ones are actually the cirrus, layer, cirrus cloud classification. Um, so it's, it's a quick way to verify that 
everything looks properly processed at the end. You know, we see what we would expect to see with an NDVI curve. Uh, the scene classification layer seems to be correct. You know, labeling as vegetation when we see the peak in NDVI, uh, that all makes sense. So let's move down and do that again. I picked out another pixel, in this case, a rice one uh, to confirm that. And this is, the, this is the visual that I got out of that. So um, again, a very, very, a very clean, very nice uh, trend in NDVI over the entire year. And we can see these are, there's a, probably just a single crop grown in each of these cases. Um, in, in this case, you know, again, vegetation, the colors are different, but you can see for, for class four, the veg it's vegetation, it peaks right here in the middle of the year, uh, middle of the summer, when we would expect the crop to be growing. And it's labeled as rice, and that's what we expect. Now, we took a, there was actually a double crop within the, the test um, data, so I wanted to view that as well, see what a pixel of that looks like. And uh, it, again, just as we would expect. So earlier in the year, this is, this is going to be the winter wheat crop. Uh, and we see that the vegetation peaks. It's labeled as such, and then it actually we see that it, it must have been harvested, and then there's a very low low point where in the NDVI where it's also classified without vegetation, which then peaks again when uh, the soybeans are at full growth. So, and this is labeled as winter wheat and soybean. And then finally, uh, you know, I use a a, uh, a a soybean one. Well, actually, I don't think I have a corn one as well. Um, but again, double checking all of these, you know, again we're seeing the the peak, we're seeing it labeled properly um, with a few scattered uh, clouds. Um, you know, these are labeled as uh, light clouds or cirrus clouds uh, for each of these. So this is a corn pixel and this is a, a soybean pixel. So again, just some different visualizations that are possible. Um, and, and you can do many other types of visualizations as well to double check the data. But this, this shows that, you know, we have our data formatted in a way that's ready for time series modeling where we can start doing crop predictions um, but the next step will be to get these uh, formatted for a data loader, uh, or, or to to you to to basically pull these into a data loader, um, and and prepare them for modeling. And so uh, that will be part two of this series. Um, so this concludes uh, the demo part, though. And uh, uh, yeah, so let me know if you have any questions in the chat. But uh, we appreciate you uh, tuning in. Thank you, Eric. So for the summary of part one, uh, we covered how APIs can allow us to automate and scale very large data processing pipelines in preparation for analysis and model building. We covered how storing data in Parquet format and using Spark and Databricks to query and pivot or manipulate the data enables rapid investigation and transformation. The Parquet file format also has useful abstractions like partitions, which are also directories, which help us uh, process the data in a more efficient manner. And a convenient form for modeling time series imagery data involves storing in parquet table format with each row representing a pixel for a given time interval and having columns of band values, scene dates, scene classification values over that time interval and scalars for latitude and longitude representing the center point of the pixel, which could be substituted for any other geo referencing system like Uber H3 hex or Google S2 cells instead, as well as lastly, but most importantly, the prediction target, which is what the model will use to, to inform its learning processes. So looking ahead to part two, we will process the data to prepare for model training using TensorFlow datasets. We'll prop properly split the data into train val test splits to avoid data leakage. We'll convert the irregularly spaced time series imagery into bucketed time series to prepare for model training, and we'll modify the CDO labels to align with our training goals. Thank you for joining us today. Eric and John, thank you for the wonderful presentation and demonstration. Before we transition to the Q&A session, I want to remind you there will be one homework assignment which you will be able to access from the training page on March 19th. Answers must be submitted by Google Form with a due date of April 1st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars, complete the homework assignment by the deadline, and you will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. Below is the contact information for Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen, along with links to the RSET website and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings, and follow us on Twitter for other relevant announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences.
We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will get to them in the order that they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage before the start of next week's training. Thank you. Okay, hello. Yes, John, we can hear you. Uh, wonderful. Perfect. Looks like Natasha is bringing up the Q&A doc. Great. Thank you so much. And for everybody that's been submitting questions, really great questions have come in. So thank you to everybody that has posted them. Again, it's not too late. Uh, please do enter them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them in the limited time that we do have available. So jumping right into it, question one, is there any statistical analysis between interval grouping and interpolation? I mean, why exactly is interval grouping used in the CDL algorithm? Okay, so I tackled this one. Uh, this is John. The interview, uh, the interval grouping we used is just simpler. It's easier. It doesn't require additional assumptions of, of smoothing that you need for interpolation. And also, that's the method used by the CDL. So we just went with it. Um, you know, if you wanted to uh, go go forward with um, some type of interpolation, you could. Great, thanks, John. Question number two for the CDL model: Why is the accuracy changing from eighty-five percent to ninety-five percent? I can take this one. Um, this is Eric. Um, so yeah, the accuracy of the CDL differs between different crop types. Um, there's many different crop types uh, that the CDL predicts, makes predictions on, and each of those predictions have varying accuracy. Um, specifically, generally the more common crops, it's it has a higher accuracy rate, like corn and soybeans, but it's less accurate on the more uncommon crops like sorghum. Um, there's also uh, there's a link posted here. Uh, kind of discusses um, some of the different metrics, um, including the user versus producer accuracy, which is um, related to the, the common labels um, and how that impacts the accuracy. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Question number three. In machine learning, working with satellite data, which will be the minimum amount of images that you need for the model? Uh, I also uh, answered this one. Um, so I would say that the number of images um, or the time series uh, that you need varies depending on kind of your use case and the complexity of the task uh, for the for the model. Um, for our task in this training series of predicting the CDL in real time, uh, we included about 80,000 time series of, of pixels with an average of approximately 60, 60 pixels per time series um, for the training set, um, which seemed to work quite well. Uh, and we'll get into some of these details um, in part two. Awesome, thank you, Eric. Question number four, why not use radar, synthetic, or synthetic aperture radar sensors with 12 bands of Sentinel-1A to improve accuracy and overcome the factors that can affect the quality of satellite images? Yeah, this is a good question. So I, I answered this and really you could do, you could definitely do that. You could combine SAR with optical and uh, you, you could improve your temporal resolution and you might even be able to, I mean, uh, hopefully get more accurate results uh, on your detection of crop types. Um, however, it's it's more complex, and this is already, as you guys probably have seen, it's a, it's some fairly complex code, and we wanted to really try to pick a, a narrow scope. Uh, so we just wanted to use um, just uh, Sentinel Sentinel two for that reason. Also, Sentinel two is available free at large scale. Um, so if we tried to use other data sources, it could get very complex, pulling from different sources and then trying to combine them and model them. So we wanted to provide a, a minimally useful uh, example here. All right, thank you, John. Question five, what would be the Sentinel-2 image quality if we would apply cloud masking between the scene classification layer and the quality assurance 60 bands? Yeah, I don't I don't expect this to actually change uh, the, the quality of the detection of clouds a whole lot. Um, really, I think from what I know about the QA60, it's it's just a, the kind of the same version of the SCL, but applied to the level 1C, the top of atmosphere uh, processing. So. I wouldn't expect much difference there. Now, if you're using a different cloud detection algorithm, like what they have on Sentinel Hub, uh, you might get better results. All right, thank you, John. Question six, what analysis do you use to convert gaps due to scene classification layer errors into appropriate values, such as missing value imputation? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm kind of looking ahead here um, to a uh, problem we have to solve in, in the next parts, um, but, the strategy that we did is we actually didn't impute any missing values uh, due to things like SEL errors or clouds, but rather we'll we'll pad the missing values in the time series with a constant value. 
um, in which when we go to part three um, in implementing this in data loader, when we actually train this in, in with a CNN, uh, the CNN this is kind of basically telling the CNN to impute the values for us uh, implicitly during this training process. So, um, and again, we'll get into more of these details in, in the next two parts. Great, thanks Eric. Question seven, what do we need to create a crop data layer for Morocco, like the one in the US? Yeah, these are some great questions. And, you know, whether you're talking about Europe or Morocco or wherever you're from, if you want to do this for your area, one way you could do this that we recommend is to simply do what you're what we're doing here, train your model on the US uh, CDL data, but maybe sample the CDL so that it's more, uh, you know, uh, uh, formed around the type of crops you have in your area, whether that's Morocco or Europe. And then so you get this this model trained on 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 that type of crop. And then try try predicting on your area. So pick out some area of AOIs from Morocco or Europe or wherever you're from, and um, go you know run this run the part two Sentinel pro uh, processing uh, script. Get the get the data and then run part three and manipulate it um, and then and then predict on it and see how it does. And if it looks like it's reasonable, maybe you're done. If it doesn't, you might just need to fine tune. But you'll need a lot less data to fine tune than you would if you tried to train from scratch for your area. Great, John. And this one is very much uh, kind of follows on the heels. That last question is, uh, please, how can I download the cropland data layer plots and what kind of code should I use to have them? Yeah, and uh, oh, great question. Yeah, so um, the, let's see. So the actual plots are, I, I don't know if this is referring to the plots in the in Databricks um, or if this is referring to, uh, uh, the, the the actual data, the CDL data, but um, we do have like within the script, uh, basically the first script, that's where uh, we, we actually obtain all the CDL data. It only takes about five minutes to run. And so if you run that, um, it's it's really, you, you don't have to change anything. It will get all the data for the area of interest we've pre-selected for you. And then, you know, you can start, you know, running the plots. You could take some screenshots of them. You could download them. Uh, directly from Databricks, um, but uh, that's hopefully that answers your question. Great. And question nine uh, is the is hierarchical data format version five also a common file format used in remote sensing? Yep. Good question. Um, I I'm not sure if it's a necessarily a common file format specifically for remote sensing, but certainly uh, when you're working with large data and distributed cloud computing. Um, HDF, HDF5 and Parquet files are, are very common uh, when working um, with this type of data. Um, so it, it can certainly be used for remote sensing data like we do in, in this training. Um, and yeah, it works very well. Great, thanks, Eric. And I will say that, yes, NASA does distribute a lot of, uh, a lot of different data uh, products in HDF5. So that, that is quite common uh, file format for, for NASA. And question 10, can we use X-Array to make the process easier to handle? Yeah, I'm sure in, if you liked other functions in Python besides roster IO, like X-Array, sure, I'm sure that you could probably substitute uh, for that. All I would recommend is like, uh, you know, just compare it to the original function. So, you know, run the same exact data through the, the original, um, make whatever, whatever modifications you want with X-Array or whatever functions you like. Um, you know, run it again, get the data out, and and make sure that it matches what you you know the the original the original output. Great, thanks, John. Question eleven: Can I run the code on Google Colab? Yeah, this should be possible as long as you kind of have uh, Spark installed. You can get Spark installed on your Google Colab instance or whatever environment that you're uh, running in. Um, I will note that if you just use these Python files directly in Google Colab, it won't likely work without making some changes. Uh, the biggest change is likely um, the file paths for where you store uh, the data. Uh, most of the files uh, paths that we work with in Databricks uses the Databricks file store, which um, is not going to be available in Google Colab. So those those will need to be changed. Um, but yeah, th this this code that we generated is, is generalizable to the computing environment uh, that you're using as long as you can get Spark installed. Great, thanks, Eric. And question uh, 12 uh, is very similar to question seven. Uh, it's, can I try on other areas of interest that are not within the United States? 
Yep, and it's very similar to question 14 as well. I know there's a lot of questions on this. And yes, this is very, very much intended to be applicable to other areas. Um, we really intended for you to to try this out on the CDL in the US, get a feel for how it looks, uh, to try and build a model at a very large scale um, on on predicting crop type. And then, you know, you can you can apply it to your area. So that, as I mentioned before, that could probably that could be just that you tr you pick out crops from the CDL that um, you know, are simply, uh, you know, matching the, the crop distribution in your area. And then, and then once you have a, a model trained for those crops, you can apply it, uh, to areas that, you know, uh, that you, you know, from your country or your, your region. Great. Thanks, John. And I think, uh, just trying to be respectful of everybody's time, uh, maybe we'll end it on this question here. So question 13, uh, do we resample Sentinel-2 data to 30 meter spatial resolution anywhere in the code? Yeah, that's another good question. If it wasn't clear, we we are not like actually resampling. What we are doing is we're just sampling the rosters. So we're we're trying to move from roster format, a spatial format, into a, ta a tabular format because it's easier to work with. So each each row of the pixel of or each row of the table eventually, finally, the output of part three ends up being um, like a a single CDL pixel for a single year. So it's kind of a thirty meter area that that represents. And then we have a time series of imagery associated with that that we use to train our model on, and and then we can same thing for the test data set. So that's that's what that actual that's what that final table actually represents. So each row is a 30 meter pixel, but we didn't actually like resample anything, you know, so to speak. We really just um, were sampling data and putting it into a specific time series format so that we could model it. So we moved from spatial to uh, maybe you would say vector format, so to speak. And, and we have the ability to move back to spatial later. Wonderful. Uh, well, we do realize that we're 15 minutes over the time, but but thank you so much for everybody that did submit a question. And we know that we did not get through all of them uh, in today's for, uh, part one, but what we will do is uh, address and answer the rest of these questions that we did not go through in today's part, and we will post them before next Tuesday, which is the next uh, second part of this webinar series. So we'll have them posted uh, to that our training page before next Tuesday. Um, uh, John, Eric, thank you both so much. I mean, you guys knocked it out of the park today. Just tremendous job. As we were wrapping up, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to, any closing comments that you might have for the part participants today. Yeah, just thank you everyone for attending. We really enjoy uh, seeing everyone from all over the world kind of commenting in the chat. And uh, we love to answer your questions, see that you're learning and have, have some use cases for this. Uh, we really tried to make this scalable in general for you all. So reach out if you have any questions. Our emails are um, in the in the documents. And uh, you know we, we look forward to the next couple training sessions as well where we show you how to model with this data. And Eric, did you have any closing comments for? Uh, yeah, ditto. I'm just ditto John's comments. Um, we're excited to kind of see what uh, the participants do with uh, do with this training series and some of the results that they come up with. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, send us any examples of, of of the things that you're able to do with this pipeline. Uh, we're excited to kind of see uh, see some of the results. So, um, yeah, thank you all. Great. Well, uh, John and Eric. Uh, Thank you both again, and I also want to acknowledge the RSET team that is working in the background. You might not have heard their voices, uh, you might not have seen them, uh, but that is uh, Natasha Johnson Griffin, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, uh, and Sarah Kutchall. So thank you to the RSET team. And again, I want to thank all the participants. Uh, we know that you have busy schedules uh, in your personal life and professional life, so we really hope that you got a lot out of this training, and we do hope that you'll join us all at the same time next Tuesday for part two of the webinar series. So thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thanks.